Because I feel it's appropriate, and that Zero could really be the one ring to rule them all, throughout this you'll be entertained with an awesome movie. Ever since I was little, I've always had a fascination with mathematics. As a child, it wasn't so much the idea of math as it was being able to do it. But now, as I'm starting to delve into analytical study of mathematics, I've started to notice a trend. It seems that in most of the proofs I look at, and in many of the general knowledge equations, which many of you might use in your classes day to day, that a particular number is left out. Zero. One of the most common numbers, it seems to give mathematicians the most trouble. Often they will claim it to be the exception to a rule, leave it out because it would make the rule trivial, or make specific rules just because of its nature. So what I want to know is how this little, one could say non-existent, number, which came to be so long ago, could still be causing problems today. To do this, I had to know more about how it came to be. I figured it was probably a Greek or Roman invention, considering how many scholars from their cultures are still famous, but it was still worth a look. So, like most people, the first thing I did was to Google it and peruse through what came back. Most of what I saw pointed to the ancient Arab culture as its inventors, but to me, the sites looked sketchy at best. So at this point, I used the in-class library research session to track down a few articles. Nothing was turning up from within the Michigan Tech Library, but after a bit of searching on a few other databases, one article in particular caught my eye. It said that a man named Muhammad Ibn Musa al Kwarmzi was the first person to take the abstraction of zero and actually put it to use as a number in the 9th century. But I still couldn't believe that it took so long in human history to be thought of as something more than just the absence of anything. So during the same research session, I ordered a few books off the interlibrary loan system and waited, and waited, and waited, and waited. Once the books came in, the information really started to flow. As it turned out, zero was first used as a placeholder, at least in concept. Around 1600 BC, the ancient Babylonians had a base system of counting using symbols similar to Roman numerals. But a major difference was that it only had two symbols, a wedge pointing left for 10 and a wedge pointing down for 1. Also, unlike our current system, which counts to 9 and then puts a 1 in the 10th place, theirs counted to 59 and then put a 1 in the 60th place, the way a clock would have 60 seconds every minute. This new place was separated from the previous one with a small space in between them. But a problem occurred when there needed to be more than one space signifying that one of the spots, like the 60th place, had been skipped. Since the symbols were being pressed into the clay, and there were no rules guiding how big the space needed to be, some people mistook very different numbers because they looked similar. Here's an example. The number 72 had a 1 in the 60th place and a 12 in the 1's place. It looked very similar to the number 3612, which had a 1 in the 3600's place and 12 in the 1's place. So around 300 BC, in order to alleviate this problem, they used a placeholder in the 60s place to represent nothing being there. Thus, zero as a placeholder was born. But still, it was only known then as the absence of a quantity. At this point, I was fascinated. It never occurred to me that zero never started out as the number zero. It was then that I started to unintentionally shift the focus of my research towards discovering how zero went from just a symbol holding a spot to the wonderful rule breaker we know and love today. Looking through my other sources, I found a similar story in most of them, but all of them said just about the same thing. It was then that I remembered the article which initially caught my eye, and that it was Al Quarmsey who took one of the next steps in the creation of a concrete zero. But when I got to looking, both online and in my books, I found that while his accomplishments to arithmetic were great, and that it was through his writings that the idea of zero as a concept made its way to the Western world, he did no more than the Babylonians did with zero. He just did it in a different way. 
The major difference in what they did comes in where they placed their placeholder. Isn't it ironic? Whether I missed it or overlooked it at first, I'm not sure, but the Babylonians only put their nothing symbol in the middle of their numbers. They never put them at the very end, in what we would call the ones place. But in the ninth century, al did. When I went to investigate this further, I found that the original translation was only in one library in the WorldCat system. So I had to look through what was available to me in order to find a reference to that particular source. What I eventually found was that, at the time, he was using a number system which used nine symbols standing in for one through nine. And he noticed that when he wanted to count just ten, a one in the tens place and nothing in the ones place, that it looked the same as if he just wanted to count one, just a one in the ones place. So what Al Quarmsey did was to say that when there was nothing in a lower place, they would put an open dot in to represent that the space was empty and devoid of any units. It may not seem like a huge advancement, but in reality, it then allowed anyone to finally decipher a number correctly without having to worry about how far apart from one another the places of a number were. So what that really means is that what you write down in math lecture is the same as what your buddy eventually decodes from your chicken scratch. But all this left me feeling empty, so to speak. I now knew that zero started as a placeholder, and was used as a placeholder, and was made into a better placeholder. But what I didn't know was how it came to be an actual number. So to figure this out, I went back to the books. It wasn't very long before I got a hint of what I was looking for. As I continued to read, I learned that before it could be realized as a number, zero would have to have a distinct symbol attached to it. Now, of course, we know today that ended up as the symbol for zero, but putting that fact aside, I found an interesting couple of chapters devoted to how it got its shape. And, as it turns out, the most agreed upon idea needs the use of stones and sand. See, when Greeks needed to manipulate numbers, either for trade or accounting, their treasures would use a counting tablet. If we were to have one of these today, it would have the columns for the ones, tens, hundreds, and thousands, and so on, which you would place stones under to signify one unit of that place. The Greeks didn't use the exact same place system as us, but the usage is the same. Anyways, the theory comes to us from the shape of the stones themselves. If we assume that they were about round, then it's not hard to imagine a written representation of them as a solid dot. Then the absence of a dot is an empty space where the dot is not, an open ring. But this theory holds true in practice as well as on paper. The practice of pebbling between traders had to have its checks and balances. Sand first entered the counting tables as a way to create a semi-permanent display of the transaction. When the initial value in pebbles was put onto the sand and then the quantity to re be removed was taken away, what was left was the answer in dots and the amount taken away in open rings. For example, let's say someone owed another person 24 chickens, and that to begin with they had 47 chickens. They would set up a 4 and a 7 in their correct columns and then remove 2 and 4 respectively to see that 23 remained. But also in doing this, they left behind the indents in the sand of the 24 that were removed. They could then see that the 23 plus 24 equaled the 47 and that everything was correct. This allowed both parties to look the transaction over and come to an agreement, and eventually led to the idea that if a stone is removed, the impression that is left behind is the symbol for the absence of anything, and therefore it was correlated to the place-filling effect of the idea of zero. This meant that a zero could now be placed in any column, which contained no units, as a number which meant no units. And so, zero the place filler became zero the number. In my study, I eventually found the roots of zero that make it one of the most complex numbers in existence. But I still never found out anything about why it is an intellectual oddball in modern day proofs and theorems. I also never got a chance to delve into how it was accepted and used after its inception into the realm of numbers. I guess I got a bit caught up, but who wouldn't? So I propose that the greater question here still needs to be identifying all the secret zero holds and bringing them into the front, because I'm sure there are people just as interested in this mysterious number. They've just never had a chance to write a paper about it.